There's a Sunday school. It sounds loud. Is it, is it good? Okay. I think it's loud enough. Okay. You can turn it up. There's a children's um, Sunday school curriculum called Route 66. Route 66. Yeah, that's appropriate. Yeah, for sure. So we look at, uh, first of all, I want to look at kind of an overview of Genesis and its place in Scripture and its place really in history. Um, Hebrew titles were typically, you know, Hebrew literature was typically named after the first word in the book or the content of the book or sometimes both. And so the Hebrew text of Genesis begins with the Hebrew word Bereshit, which means in the beginning. That's what the first, first words are, in the beginning. Uh, the English title Genesis comes from really Jerome's, uh, the church father Jerome translated the Bible into Latin, the Latin Vulgate. And the first book was Liber Genesis, which is the book of Genesis, and which means the book of origins. So we have in the beginning the book of origins, thus we have the name for the first book of the Bible. And it's the first book of the Hebrew canon, the first book of our scripture. And it's uh, the first five books together in Hebrew is called the Torah, the Greek, the Pentateuch. You've heard both of those terms, penta meaning five. And it's not a particularly easy book to deal with or understand. Um, and there's reasons for that. I'm sure everybody here has read through Genesis, and you know the, the storyline. But uh, hopefully we can help with that today as we're going to focus in on some particular themes. And so, for instance, if we look at <clears throat> understanding it, Moses is given credit for writing the first five books of the Bible. And that, that includes Genesis, but we know that he was not alive during the time of Genesis, so most likely information was passed down to him from earlier writings, from oral tradition, and also we've got to keep in mind, as Paul told Timothy, all Scripture is breathed by God, so God was superintending this whole uh, circumstance, so we have the Bible in the form that we have today. And as we look at Scripture too, the first 11 chapters of Genesis form the foundation, and that is where critics come in and try to take the legs out. You know, if they can disprove the creation, the flood account, and everything that, that transpired in those first 11 chapters up to Abraham, then they can take out the scripture. They can, they can make it look like a house of cards. Jesus, though, affirms. He says, right, as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the coming of the Son of Man. So he affirms those first uh, books. He talks about marriage. He talks about creation in the garden. And so uh, Christ then defends, especially those first 11 books. Um, another thing to think about is there were other cultures contemporary with Israel in the ancient Near East. They weren't living in a vacuum. After the flood, then the sons of Noah went out and began to repopulate the earth. And we have some uh, other literature accounts of the creation. There's one called the uh, Enuma Elish in the Akkadian language. The Babylonians and the, and the Assyrians use that language. There's another work that's famous because it has an account of a worldwide flood, the Gilgamesh epic. It's dated about 1800 BC, and we know this from archaeological findings. And basically, these epics were using gods, small g gods, to tell the story of things they didn't understand. And a lot of people say, well, look, they have a flood account, so the, the people who wrote the Bible copied from them. Well, no, it's just a fact if when you see a, a, a flood account in other cultures, it showed those sons of Noah went out and as repopulated, they would, that story would be there. There was indeed a worldwide flood. So it actually gives you more impetus to believe in, the, in what's in the scripture. So the Bible then tells the truth of what they tried to tell through their false gods and through their mythological tales. Um, there's an Old Testament scholar named Tremper Longman, and he writes this. This is, this is interesting. He said, the book of Genesis is not a history-like story, but rather a story-like history. So you think about that. It's not a history-like story. So in other words, it's not a, a, um, a story that's a little bit like history, and they throw some things in there. It's rather, it is a story-like history. And so it's telling the history of, uh, of what happened with God's people from the very beginning. It contains numerous genealogies. We'll talk about that here in a second. And because of that, we can trace names back through time, compare them with historical leaders through archaeological findings that we know for sure. Give you an example. Uh, like through Babylon, Egypt, Assyria, we know the rulers, the names of the rulers of the Neo-Sumerian period from 2100 B.C. to 1900 B.C. We have those names in archaeological findings. Well, in that time, this is the Neo-Sumerian period, 
was included the city-state of Ur. And that's the town that Abram was called to go to the land of Canaan when his father lived there. And he went to Haran and then went on to the land of Canaan. So that actually, again, when you see that historically, then you say, well, that, you know, the Bible's telling that story using historical figures, people who lived really and walked the earth. It's not a myth. And uh, the, I mentioned earlier about the genealogies. And there's a Hebrew word called toledot. And what that is, is you'll see in Scripture, it'll say, these are the generations of. These are the generations of. And it says that with Adam. The generations of Adam. It talks about his sons and grandsons. And then we have, after Noah, the, the flood account. These are generations of Noah. These are generations of Abraham. And it tells the story of the offspring. And basically, it's a family tree. And we take that family tree, and you can put in the years, and we can count backwards. We're not going to get into discussion of the age of the earth, but the Bible will tell us, you know, the time of Abraham uh, would be about 2000 BC, somewhere in that range. Okay? And you can take that, those toledotes and count backwards. But it's like 10 times in Genesis, it'll stop and it'll say, These are generations of the sons of Jacob, the sons of Esau. And you'll see it there in Scripture. And Francis Schaeffer said, This kind of gives unity to Scripture. Because you stop and you pause and you look, look at these people living in history during the time this was written. And so, it, again, it keeps God. Um, showing him he's a God of order. So we look at the major themes of Genesis. The central purpose of Genesis is to lay the foundation for the rule of God over his creation. All right, we're going to look at three aspects of that. First of all, look at creation itself. The theme of creation begins and ends the Bible. The scriptures begin with uh, the creation of the universe in Genesis 1 and 2. And we go to Revelation 21 and 22. We see the new heavens and a new earth. So we have a new creation coming at the end. And the scriptures then fill in that blank. And we're going to talk about that shortly through the word covenant. Um, as we said last week, God, because he's self-existent, did not create because he was lonely or needed anything. He simply created that he might display his glory to the humans that he creates and share that glory with us. God begins with an earth that's formless and void, proceeds to bring order, Beauty and perfection to the world. God's not a God. He's a God of order, not a God of chaos. He's a God of perfection, not a God of discourse. And the pinnacle of his creation, us, God brings forth man and woman and breathes the breath of life in them and places them into this garden paradise. And there was a mandate to work the land and keep it. And Adam was told in Genesis 2, verse 16, and this will be repeated again, you surely may eat of every tree in the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. From the day you eat of it, you shall surely die. Right? And that's how uh, chapter 2 ends. <laughs> and we see then the second part, the major theme that runs through all the scripture is sin. Sin. Adam's the first man to carry out his, the representative role by exercising lordship over all the creation. That's what he was supposed to do. Exercise lordship, be in control of everything. And sin, however, entered in. It, it destroyed and marred God's perfect order. And this happens in, in chapter 3 of Genesis. And it sets in motion the tendency for humans to disobey God's rule. And it goes on and on and on. Adam then, his sin disrupted harmony with all the creation. Between man, between man and woman, between man and animals, and between all of creation, there was now discord and disharmony that's in creation. And we see that he casts him out of the garden, but it initiated God's provision of reconciliation begins at that time. Um, we see a lot of other accounts of rebellion from chapter 4 to chapter 11, and that culminates then with God reacting in judgment. However, we also see that God reaching out and initiating a covenant relationship with mankind. So we sin. God reaches out with mercy and grace. So let's look at this word covenant then. We'll spend the most of our time then looking at that. Again, we're not going to go into detail with the families of, of Abraham. We know those stories from chapter 12 on. We'll look at some key points. But looking at the word covenant, it's not a contract. We know the contract, you think about sports stars. You know, someone makes, uh, they're going to pay you $50 million for five years. And after a year, you have a great season. This guy offers you $100 million, so I'm going to break that contract and go over here. We break contracts all the time. 
the word covenant is not something that we use in that same context. God makes a covenant. He never breaks it. And he uh, instituted covenant as the Lord and creator to his creature. And that goes back even to customs in the ancient Near East where they had, you know, vassal states. Um, and they had the sovereign who would rule over them with these covenants. And the covenant depended on everything that the, in this case, what the leader did. All right. So let's look, first of all, there's, there's two covenants we're going to look at. Initially, as we said already, in this garden paradise, Adam was given what we call covenant of works. Let's look at it here. Chapters 1 and 2. So if we go to Genesis chapter 1, 26 to 28, it says, And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heaven, over the livestock, and over the earth, and every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God he created him, male and female he created them. And then verse 28, and God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens and over everything, every living thing that moves on the earth. And then we already read the scripture from chapter 2, verse 16. But he said, if we back up a second, he says in verse 15 of chapter 2 of Genesis, the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree, etc. And then they eat of it, you will surely die. One rule they had to obey. So he used to work this, had dominion over it, only one rule to obey. And God promises to grant eternal life to Adam if he obeys, but death if he disobeys. The Westminster Confession says this covenant is based on Adam's obedience. Think about that now. The blessing is not, is a, is not a gift of grace because Adam has to earn it. That's why it's called a covenant of works. He must work and render personal and perfect obedience to the commandment in order to live. Stated in the Westminster Confession. And of course we know what happens then. Chapter 3, the fall brought judgment and then the curse of death. So we go to chapter 3 of Genesis. And we have this trial, so to speak. We see the serpent and the woman and the man on trial before the Lord. And he pronounces the curse. But with the curse, we begin to see in uh, verse 15 what's called the, the proto-evangelium, which is the, the first mention of a redeemer, of a savior. And it's, it's not out there. He's not naming Jesus Christ is going to come. But we see here, he says to the serpent, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. That's the promise of a redeemer. We can see the foundation, the covenant of grace in that particular pronouncement. Although man has failed and will continue to fail, God will establish a people for himself based on his works, not on man's works. See the difference between the covenant of works and the covenant of grace? It doesn't depend now on us. It depends on God. He promised this would come. He could have simply eliminated them, right? He could have just wiped them out. But instead, he shows them grace with a promise for the future. They're banished. They cannot return to the garden. He puts a cherub there with a flaming sword to prevent them from getting back to the tree of life. And then if we go, like I said, to Revelation, we see this process reversed because of the work of Christ. But the promise starts here in chapter 3, verse 15. So this covenant of grace, then, as we, as we go through, we see man's sin becomes even more grievous to God, and he pronounces the judgment of the flood, except for Noah and his family. He saved them by his grace. It says Noah was found righteous in God's eyes. And after the flood, the waters subside. This is over in chapter 8, the end of eight, chapter 9 of Genesis. Um, we read that God establishes a covenant with Noah. And look at the end of chapter 8. Of, he says, Noah built an altar to the Lord and took some of every clean animal, some of every clean bird, and offered burnt offerings. And when the Lord smelled the pleasing aromas, there's that usage of, of human anatomy on God, but he smelled the pleasing aroma. The Lord said, I will never again curse ground because of man, for the intention of man's heart is evil from his youth. Neither will I ever again strike down every living, every living creature as I have done. And here's the promise. While the earth remains, seed time and harvest, 
Cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall not cease. And then over in chapter 9, we're familiar with the covenant of the rainbow. And the word covenant is used in this paragraph multiple times. Uh, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and your offspring for you, and with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the livestock, and every beast of the earth. And he, re he renews this covenant. He says, I establish my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And then he says in verse 12, this is a sign of the covenant that I make between me and you and every living creature. I've set my bow in the clouds. It'll be a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. And so God is renewing this covenant. Martin Lloyd-Jones said that this is not a new covenant of grace. He's simply giving a specific promise that God would temporarily restrain his wrath. It's still under the covenant of grace, but he's renewing it with Noah. Okay? And then we see there's a, there's a toledote there. Again, the genealogy of the sons of Noah, and then we come to chapter 11, and we see, as this continues, we come to a man named Abram, okay? And really key passage in Scripture, this is like those first 11 chapters, and we leave that, and we, now we're going to go and spend the rest of Genesis is on the family of Abram, Abraham, and his offspring. And the Abrahamic covenant, we know that Abram was called out of Ur of the Chaldeans. He was a pagan. He was not a Jew. He's not a Hebrew. Okay? That, was the, that wasn't a thing. And, and he called him to become the future, the, the father of the, God's future people. L listen to chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. The Lord God said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Again, he's making this promise to Abram as a covenant of grace. Okay? He's, not, he's not having to perform for this. This is God's promise, that he will prosper him. He will make his name great. And through him, all the peoples of earth will be blessed. And we know the story of Abram. And he was told that through his offspring, the world would be blessed through him. But he has a problem, right? He doesn't have an offspring. He doesn't have any offspring. And he complains to the Lord. He says, Lord, I, I don't know how this is going to happen because right now, if I was to die, my slave Eliezer would, would inherit everything. And in chapter 15, a very key verse in Scripture used in the New Testament multiple times by Paul. He says, the word of the Lord came to him, this man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, look toward heaven and number the stars if you're able to number them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And this key verse, Genesis 15, verse 6, and he believed the Lord and he counted to him as righteousness. So God appears to him, renews that covenant, the covenant of blessing that would come, the covenant of grace. And then there's a very strange story after that that occurs uh, later on in chapter 15. And if you ever wondered, this is a very uh, kind of a strange event, but it's God sealing that covenant. Um, let me see if I can explain it better. We'll read here. Basically, he said, I am the Lord who brought you out of Ur the Chaldeans to give this land to you to possess. And Abram answers, but O oh Lord... How am I to know that I shall possess it? This is 15, verse 8 and 9. And the Lord said, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. He didn't cut the birds. He left the birds whole. And so there's, there's this strange sacrifice going on here. And it says, as, as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram, and behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. And the Lord spoke to him there. He, he pronounced basically they would be taken in slavery in Egypt, much in the future. They would serve a foreign land, and they'll be brought back to this land with great possessions. They'll come out of Egypt, which indeed happened, right? And then he says this in, in verse 17. It says, When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between the pieces, between those animals. And on that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, to your offspring I will give this land 
from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates, the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, and it goes on to name all the tribes that were living in Canaan at that time. And he would give them that land. Again, renewing the covenant, the covenant of grace. And that, that strange uh, ceremony there, basically God was saying that this is my promise unto death. But funny thing is God cannot die, but neither can God break a covenant. Right? So that was done in, in, in other customs in ancient Near East. They would have that kind of ceremony, and the person walking through would, would pledge at the point of death. But God's doing that to show, I will not back out on my covenant. I'm a covenant-keeping God. And if we look at this, like, it's almost like um, a relay race. You know, Noah gets, the, the Adam gets the baton, hands it to Noah, hands it to Abraham, and then it goes to, the, to Jacob, I mean, from Isaac to Jacob. And we see this covenant renewal uh, going on to Isaac in chapter 26, verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> we know that Isaac then, being the son of the promise, and we have the story of when he was tested to take him up on the mountain and sacrifice him there. This, your son, the only son whom you love, take him up and sacrifice him. We knew it was a test. He did not know it was a test. Again, a little glimpse of, of Christ, the father giving his son whom he loved. And we see these, these little glimpses of Christ uh, in the book of Genesis as we look forward. Um, 26 verses 1 to 5 of Genesis. It says, There was a famine in the land beside the former famine that was in the days of Abraham. Isaac went to Gerar to Abimelech, king of the Philistines. The Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Dwell in the land of which I shall show you. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with you and bless you. For to you and your offspring I will give all these lands. And I will establish the oath that I swore to Abraham your father. So he's renewing that covenant then with Isaac. I will multiply your offspring as stars of the heaven and give to your offspring all these lands. And in your offspring all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Same thing he told his father Abraham. Chapter 28 then, Isaac's son Jacob, the deceiver. We know all the things that Jacob did. It reads like a, uh, one of those daytime dramas. These are sinful people, but God's using them. I mean, you think of the things they did. Saying that uh, my wife and my sister to keep from getting killed and, and on and on and on just goes in, in the perversity of the sons of, of Jacob, some of the things that they do. But nevertheless, God had made a covenant promise. Uh, Genesis 28, verses 10 to 15. Jacob has a dream. He left Beersheba, went toward Haran, and he came to a certain place and stayed there that night because the sun had set. He took one of the stones and put it under his head, and he's, and he's sleeping in a dream. He dreamed there was a ladder set up on the earth, Jacob's ladder, right? We know that story. And the angels were ascending and descending. And it says, And behold, the Lord stood above it and said to Jacob, I am the Lord, the God of Abraham, your father, and the God of Isaac. The land on which you lie I will give to you and your offspring. Your offspring shall be like the dust of the earth, and you shall spread abroad to the west and to the east and north and to the south. And in you and your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Covenant renewal, the covenant of grace. He's, he's making that promise, and God keeps a covenant. He never backs out on a covenant. And we know we take that then from uh, the sons of Jacob through the tribe of Judah onward to David, and then forward to the New Testament we come to Jesus Christ. And then the book of Genesis ends in chapter 50 with Joseph's declaration of God's sovereignty over all things. Remember that. He was sold by his brothers into slavery, spends all those years in prison, and then as God would have it, as he controls all things, he rises to prominence. And after the death of Jacob... His brothers are afraid he's going to take vengeance on them. And, of course, he does not. He tells them this at the end of chapter 50. What you meant for evil, God meant for good, the saving of his people. So God is sovereign over all things. He's superintending this. And the book of Genesis should, you know, as the foundation to our faith, fill us with that um, knowledge that God is a covenant-keeping God. Way back in the beginning, Adam, our forefather, broke that. God came in. And made that covenant of grace. And so we bring that then, just a brief moment, we'll finish up here, to the book of Galatians in the New Testament. Paul goes back and draws on some of this covenant talk in, uh, in Galatians chapter 3. <clears throat> 
he's talking to them, and he gives a, a recount about faith versus works. And he says, Foolish Galatians, who's bewitched you? It was before your eyes that Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified. Let me ask you this. Did you receive the Spirit by works of the law or by hearing with faith? Are you so foolish, having begun in the Spirit, you're now being perfected by the flesh? Did you suffer so many things in vain, if indeed it is in vain? Does he who supply the Spirit to you and works miracles among you do so by works of law or by hearing of faith? Just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness. So he's going back and telling them, the saints in the Old Testament are saved the same way that we are, by faith, by believing God, believing his promises, believing the one that he sent. And then he says, uh, over to verse 7, he says, Know then that it is those of faith who are the sons of Abraham, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, this verse again, repeated many times in scripture, In you shall all the nations be blessed. So then those who are of faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. And he goes on to talk about how Jesus fulfilled the law of God and died for us as a curse to break that curse of death against us. And so the covenant of grace, first mentioned back in Genesis 3, has now been fulfilled by the death, the burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And to God be the glory, for he is sovereign over all things. And that's pretty much the synopsis of the book of Genesis. If you look at it from the standpoint of creation, sin, and then God stepping in as a covenant-keeping God, covenant of works, man disqualified it. He, he disobeyed. He broke it. And God comes in with a covenant of grace. And we see that renewed and renewed and renewed. And we still live under that covenant of grace that he sent his son that we might be saved. Because we can't do it ourselves, that's for sure. Any questions? Any comments?